Welcome everyone, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed participants. We are delighted you can join us for today's virtual event on Protecting the Environment is Protecting Civilians. This event is uh, brought to you by the permanent mission of Switzerland to the United Nations, the permanent mission of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam to the United Nations, Joint UNEP OCHA Environment Unit, the Environmental Peace Building Association, and PACS. We're delighted you can be here with us. My name is Carl Brook. I'm president of the Environmental Peace Building Association. And it's an honor to uh, um, talk, uh, to, to moderate this session. And we have an incredible collection of speakers. Today's agenda is going to start with some opening remarks from His Excellency, uh, Mr. Jörg Lauber, uh, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Switzerland to the United Nations. Then we'll have three presentations from our distinguished panelists, Bim Zweinenberg of PAX, Amelia Wallström from the Joint UNEP OCHA Environment Unit, and Vanessa Murphy from the International Committee of the Red Cross. I'll share a few remarks after that, and then we'll open up the uh, question and answer session with a few minutes remaining, we will uh, close the session and have some concluding remarks from His Excellency Mr. Dong Dinh Ki, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam to the United Nations. Next, please. So I'd like to first introduce Ambassador Lauber. Ambassador Lauber is the Permanent Representative of Switzerland to the United Nations in New York. Since 2015, he is the chair of the Burundi configuration of the UN Peacebuilding Commission. In June 2019, he was elected chair of the open-ended working group on developments in the field of information and telecommunications in the context of international security. Before joining the Swiss, Department, Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs in 1993, he worked in peacekeeping missions in Namibia and Korea. As a diplomat, he was posted in Bangkok, Bern, Beijing, and the permanent mission of Switzerland to the United Nations in New York. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carl, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Happy uh, Peacekeeper's Day uh, to everybody, for those who didn't have it on their agenda. Uh, colleagues, it is, it is really a great honor and a pleasure to welcome you all to today's uh, virtual, of course, side event entitled Protecting the Environment is Protecting Civilians. And I'm particularly grateful for being able to co-host this side event together with my colleague, uh, Ambassador Dong Ying Ki, permanent representative of Vietnam to the United Nations. I also would like to commend the organizers for planning this event during the POC weekend and thank uh, my own staff for making all the necessary arrangements. Colleagues, with the unprecedented challenges that the world is facing, with this COVID-19 crisis, protection issues are even more crucial. The pandemic poses a threat to human security and exacerbates vulnerable civilians and communities living in conflict and crisis situations. As many speakers have highlighted during this POC week already, women and children once again are particularly concerned. Switzerland therefore welcomes and continues to support the UN Secretary General's call for an immediate global ceasefire in light of the pandemic. And we call on the Security Council to endorse this call without delay, although delay we've already seen quite a bit. In his 2020 report to the Security Council on the protection of civilians, which was published at the beginning of this month, the UN Secretary General highlights the direct and significant impact of armed conflict on the natural environment, threatening the safety and security of civilians and communities even more. In the joint statement of the Group of Friends on Protection of Civilians at the Open Video Conference on Wednesday, Switzerland, in its capacity as the chair of the group, welcomed the increased attention given to this topic in the Secretary General's report. In our view, we should go further. We should agree on concrete mitigating measures. 
Armed conflicts and climate change contribute to serious environmental degradation and damage. Their detrimental impact exacerbates the suffering of populations that are affected by conflict or crisis and are therefore particularly vulnerable. In turn, the consequences of climate change and environmental degradation can also be triggered, can also be a trigger for conflicts or prolonged ongoing ones and thus not only increase the humanitarian costs on civilians and civilian infrastructure, but also threaten sustaining peace and development efforts in general. The targeting of water-related installations, as well as collateral damage resulting from conflicts, impact the functionality of water systems and can ultimately result in environmental urgencies. For example, the destruction of wastewater treatment facilities can pose a serious threat to both human health and ecosystems. Switzerland has always supported, through what we call the Blue Peace Initiative, the work of the Global High Level Panel on Water and Peace. The panel, in its report with the title A Matter of Survival, calls for restraint with respect to the environment during armed conflict. It also encourages provisions of environmental and water protection in ceasefire, cooperation, and peace agreements. There is an overwhelming recognition among UN member states, civil society, and academics of armed conflict on the environment and their, uh, of the, sorry, of the impact of armed conflict on the environment and therefore on civilians. Many actors have repeatedly called for a comprehensive, coherent, and coordinated UN system-wide approach to prevent and address protection issues linked to environmental degradation due to, um, to, due to armed conflict. Knowledge sharing and common operational programming are essential to prevention. Today's event offers an essential and timely platform to advance on these calls. Its aim is mainly to address two issues. First, how can we further raise awareness and promote dialogue within the UN system, including within the Security Council, on the interlinkages between the protection of the environment and the protection of civilians? And second, how can we ensure a coordinated and coherent approach, especially throughout the UN system, while building on existing mechanisms? To answer these questions, leading experts from PACS the Joint UNEP Ultra Environment Unit, NTICRC, will talk about recent and current conflicts and at risk situations, about leadership and coordination issues, as well as about legal and policy developments in this regard. I'm confident that we have the right expertise gathered here today with our panelists and the president of the board of directors of the Environmental Peace Building Association, who is moderating the discussion. We also have a very diverse audience whose own experiences and questions certainly will enrich our discussions. Thank you very much for being here again this afternoon. Carl, over to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lauber. You mentioned leadership, and I'd like to just briefly thank you and thank Switzerland for your sustained leadership in this space. Switzerland has done some amazing things here, and thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, turn to the uh, panel, but before I do that, I'd like to have uh, a few housekeeping uh, notes. First of all, the participants' microphones have been muted and cameras switched off by the hosts during the presentations. You're welcome to communicate with the organizers at any time uh, via the Zoom chat function at the bottom of your screen. Time and technology permitting, we'll have the option of uh, switching on your microphone to participate in the interactive question and answer session following the panel. The floor will be given priority to those who have registered interest with the organizers ahead of the event. We hope to have some time still, uh, so please do submit your questions to the panel during the meeting. To do so, please use the Q&A function also at the bottom of the uh, screen. And finally, please note that this event is being recorded. It will be posted online at pactsforpeace.nl after the event. Uh, first speaker up is Wim Zweinenberg of PACS. Uh, 
Vim is a project leader, humanitarian disarmament at PAX. He's been working on environmental impacts of armed conflicts since 2009, with field work and projects in conflict zones, such as Iraq, Syria, and Ukraine. Vim is also a contributor to the investigative research collaborative, Belling, where he specializes in environmental open source investigation and remote sensing for data collection in armed conflicts. He received the UN Environment OCHA Green Star Award in 2017 for his work on environmental response in conflicts. He's also the coordinator of the European Forum on Armed Drones, a civil society network of NGOs working to address concerns over armed drone use and proliferation. Bim holds a master's degree in international development studies from the Radboud University in Nijmegen. With that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Carl, and thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Your Excellencies, distinguished representatives, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are pleased uh, so many of you are joining us online today for this briefing on protection of the environment and protection of civilians. And a warm welcome to you and thank you to the mission of Switzerland, the mission of Vietnam, UN Environment Program, UN OCHA, and the Environmental Peace Building Association for their support for this uh, virtual event during the Security Council's POC week. Today's event is also a promising step towards, uh, step, a promising step forward to strengthen our dialogue on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts. It is a unique opportunity for us to bridge one of the many gaps between the different international communities, namely those working on environmental protection, international law, disarmament, and peace and security. Though for outsiders, the linkages aren't always clear. And I hope to, to show you today through our work as a peace organization working on the environment while building those connections uh, is needed to save lives and livelihoods. I will do this by outlining the environmental dimensions of armed conflict based on my research and our work on and behind the front lines in Iraq, Syria, and the Ukraine over the last 10 years, often with support of our invaluable local partners. The most recent visible example of environmental damage in conflicts with severe humanitarian consequences that attracted headlines was when ISIS set fire to 19 oil wells and later stockpiles of sulfur in, in late 2016. Darkness clouded Iraq horizons for eight months while the toxic smoke from the burning sulfur killed over 20 people, hospitalizing over a thousand more. Nearby IDP camps hosting over 100,000 displaced civilians were covered under the smoke for months, compounding health risks. Less visible was the wider environmental damage, including from destruction of Iraq's agricultural system and water infrastructure. Many of the major city, cities once occupied by ISIS were left in rubble. A crumbling oil industry that kept causing spills and the lack of environmental governance leading to the dumping of toxic waste. The Iraqi government estimated that the cost of environmental damage to be over 70 million US dollars. Only with support from Norway, the EU, and Japan, currently some of the environmental issues are being addressed, but more work is needed uh, to a country already struggling with climate security-related stressors. In Donbas, eastern Ukraine, the ongoing hostilities between the Russia-backed separatists and the Ukrainian army kept, keep putting civilian lives at risk. Only earlier this month, the shelling of a wastewater treatment plant resulted in the pollution of a nearby river, where over 450,000 people depend on for water needs. Over the last six years, continuous strikes near and some on chemical uh, factories, combined with flooded mines storing toxic and radioactive waste, risked a major environmental disaster. In the worst case, it could leave a significant part of the region uninhabitable if the surface and groundwater gets polluted from a misfired artillery shell hitting a factory or water pumping station. Water infrastructure remains at risk of being targeted. That could either result in an acute technological hazard from the storage of large quantities of chlorine or the absence of access to clean water if pipelines are hit. The next, in, a, in the last five uh, years, PAX has worked on data collection, monitoring and field projects to identify environmental damage from ongoing conflicts. In particular, Syria's oil industry contributes contributed to severe environmental health risk from conflict-borne pollution. The collapse of professional refining further resulted in the widespread practices of makeshift oil refining by civilians. Ongoing research by Pax identified tens of thousands of these refineries throughout Syria, where workers, many of them children, are exposed to toxic smoke and hazardous substances on a daily basis. 
Attacks and damage to oil facilities by states and non-state actors resulted in oil spills and waste products from flowing into rivers and creeks, affecting water sources for local communities. And this is just one aspect of envir environmental damage in Syria. Urban warfare poses additional um, environmental health risk to civilians. Intense shelling and use of explosive weapons in populated areas risk hitting civilian or industrial infrastructure, which could result in the release of hazardous chemicals or other toxics. As an example, this map here on the slide is Mosul, whose center was heavily damaged and many parts totally destroyed. It shows all the potential environmental, environmental hotspots as identified by the Joint Environment Unit, a building on facts of open source work. Moreover, heavy metals and residues from munitions can pose acute and long-term health risk, while conflict rubble often contains industrial and medical waste, and sustained exposure to pulverized building materials poses serious medical risks for two first responders and cleanup workers. In post-conflict situations, the dumping of debris and rubble can impact groundwaters, while quarries for reconstruction materials are known to affect water sources and ecological sensitive sites in post-conflict areas, with, with past uh, examples from Lebanon and Iraq. Over the last few years, we also noticed the disturbing occurrence of an old tactic, namely weaponization of the environment. From scorch, scorched earth tactics to deliberate destruction of environmental infrastructure, civilians keep bearing the brunt of war. Last year, in both Syria and Iraq, widespread use of deliberate burning of crop fields, either by torching them, as happened in Iraq and Syria by the so-called Islamic states, or by states using incendiary weapons in Idlib and Aleppo, which destroyed tens of thousands of acres of harvestable crops. Firefighters, farmers, and others died trying to fight these fires, while in the long term, this puts food security of entire regions at risk, particularly affecting already vulnerable populations such as refugees and the displaced, and with potential further destabilizing effects on post-conflict reconstruction efforts. Current incidents in Northeast Syria to stop the flow of drinking water as an enforcement tactic in negotiation also resulted in hundreds of thousands of people lacking access to clean water, a basic need in particular during the COVID-19 pandemic. Targeting water infrastructure in Yemen, combined with systematic environmental governance collapse, has resulted in over one million cases of cholera and other communicable diseases. During armed conflict, state capacity to regulate and uphold environmental laws and governance structures often fail. One major issue we have come across in our work in conflict zones are the environmental health risk and ecological damage resulting from the collapse of environmental governance. Lack of proper waste collection and storage in safe landfills results in dumping of waste that leads to the spread of um, communicable diseases. Open waste burning has led to the hospitalization of civilians with respiratory problem problems in various communities back visited in northeast Syria. On this image here, you see an example of such practice near Kamishli in northeast Syria and an open waste dump in Hasika city where local authorities struggle to deal with the growing amounts of household, medical and industrial waste due to the humanitarian blockade and a crumbling, conflict-affected local governance infrastructure. In the meantime, in Western Syria, we are witnessing massive deforestation in the mountainous areas, driven by illegal logging for energy needs, charcoal production, and a lack of regulation, which also is impacting biodiversity and protected areas. After this perhaps gloomy overview, you might wonder what can be done to address all these environmental dimensions of armed conflict. Well, we believe there's much that can be done to prevent, mitigate, and minimize these impacts and improve protection of civilians. And let me briefly explore some options of how practice and policies can contribute to that. First of all, we see a role for increasing understanding of these environmental conflict dynamics through improved data collection, sharing, and analysis and response. Pax has pioneered research in the last couple of years to build a systemic approach to using open source investigation, remote sensing, and field work to better map these issues and share this info with relevant humanitarian stakeholders. Through our data collection and sharing process, albeit limited and on a shoestring budget, we see ample opportunities to improve response work on an acute and long-term, uh, to address acute and long-term health risk to communities. Moreover, this data and analysis also helps building advocacy to address the environment and the life cycle of conflicts. So how to address this? We've been thinking about how and where and what kind of work is needed, both on policy and on a practical level. 
As you will hear from our distinguished speakers from the ICRC, we can work to improve military guidelines and engage with the military on their practice around targeting and military operations. From a legal side, there is the International Law, Law Commission's important work to strengthen protection of the environment in armed conflict. During conflicts, the aforementioned data collection and better informed humanitarian response can help protect and save lives. The data and understanding of environmental damage can also be utilized for rapid environmental assessment and efficient reconstruction work. All these lessons learned can help building and shaping proper mechanisms to address environmental damage from armed conflicts, strengthen accountability on state and non-state practice, and improve norm building on, on peer actor protection of the environment in armed conflict. So the question now is not what the environment can do for you, but which, what you can do for the environment. First of all, uh, various relevant aspects of environmental issues are to some extent present in ongoing work by international organizations. But it requires strengthening and mainstreaming throughout the UN system to make it more effective and coherent. We now work in different forums utilizing a piecemeal approach, struggling to share expertise and find common language and methodologies across legal policy development and environmental bodies at the UN, such as the UN Environmental Assembly, the UN General Assembly, the UN Security Council, the UN Human Rights Council, international conventions such as, such as the Convention on Biodiversity and through Sustainable Development Goals, as well as within and across governments. To optimize efforts to protect the environment in armed conflict and thereby improve civilian protection capacities, we must establish coordinated, coherent UN system-wide policies together with civil society-driven research to address the breadth of issues associated with environment and conflict. Can we perhaps envision something like a conflict and environment damage mechanism? Food for thought. And I thought I would like to prefer you to our analysis in the PAX Planetary Security Initiative uh, briefing paper uh, made after the ARIA formula meeting from December last year. Second is to improve data collection, analysis and sharing. Our work, shows er uh, our work earlier shown demonstrates the merits of this process. Third, providing a voice to affected communities at all levels of policymaking, as environmental damage can be less tangible and is often lacking priority in response. These concerns are often missing the proper attention while, these can while they can have long-term societal consequences. And lastly, we call upon states to make funding available to undertake the data collection, sharing, response and recovery on the environment in and after armed conflicts. Such work is a cost-effective way to prevent, mitigate, and minimize environmental health risk and facilitate rapid recovery work, improving civilian protection along the way. I will leave it as uh, I, leave it, I will leave this at this. And if you have any more questions, my contact and details are below in the slide. And I would like to thank you again to our fellow panelists for the participation and to the ambassadors for their contribution and for Mr. Krobruch for moderating this event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vim. Um, very great way to start us off, very concrete, and uh, um, I think very inspirational in making us want to do something. <laughs> um, and I also really like the, some of the options you present. Our next speaker, it will be Ms. Amelia Wallstrom. She is with the Joint UNEP OCHA Environment Unit, where she works as a program officer the joint unit is a 25-year partnership addressing the environmental dimensions of emergencies. Amelia has 15 years experience working on environmental sustainability and disaster risk management within the UN, government, and private sector in the field and at the headquarters level. In her current role, she works with a wide network of partners to strengthen the global response to environmental emergencies and to enhance the sustainability of humanitarian action. She holds a master's degree in chemical engineering and is trained uh, and is a trained United Nations Disaster Assessment and Coordination, UNDAC, mechanism member. Amelia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for also um, for organizing this uh, event uh, on a very important and, and topical subject. So in my, may I have the next slide, please? In my presentation, I will briefly first outline um, where I'm coming from. So I will talk a little bit about the UN Environment Program or UNEP and Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs or OCHA Joint Environment Unit, uh, the type of work that we do. 
And then I will continue on to Wim's uh, presentation on, on past experiences, but coming at it maybe more from a humanitarian angle, what uh, impacts does this uh, have on humanitarian relief? Um, and then I will talk a little bit um, about some, some recommendations and, and next steps that I see. Slide, please. Uh, so indeed, um, I represent the, the UNEP Auto Joint Environment Unit, which was founded over 25 years ago to bring the environmental dimensions into humanitarian crisis and emergency response. It brings together the technical expertise of, of UNEP with the UN's humanitarian coordination mandate. Um, so we are really active uh, wherever there is a humanitarian crisis, so that is also today very often conflict settings. Uh, we address both the environmental emergencies, so that can be uh, technical accidents, industrial accidents, but also looking at the environmental sustainability of humanitarian action. How is it that we provide humanitarian relief and also in conflict and protracted crisis, what type of relief do we provide and what does the, that relief, how does it impact natural resources? Next slide. Uh, so I think, um, as it was referenced in, in the previous speaker's remarks, but also in the latest um, EOC report, uh, humanitarian and environmental goals do really go hand in hand. And I think we see this at a general level as well, uh, that we cannot uh, see ourselves external to the environment, but human beings are very much part of the environment, regardless of what we do, and that applies to humanitarian relief as well. Uh, so when we protect the environment, when we safeguard natural resources, it means that we are also protecting civilians. We're protecting them from negative acute and long-term health effects that are associated with a contaminated environment. And we are also allowing them to have access to natural resources, whether that is water or clean air um, or natural resources such as wood, uh, farmland uh, for livelihoods. Uh, what we have seen in the past is that environmental damage has, has direct consequences on, on the civilians affected by, by conflict, but it also disrupts humanitarian operations. Uh, so what we saw, for example, in, in Iraq with the oil wells burning, or what we can see with chemical incidents, is that it also affects the humanitarian's uh, capability to operate because it raises staff safety concerns, security concerns. Uh, and also, of course, something like disaster waste and rubble uh, really uh, impacts access. Um, so in this respect, it's, it's, very, it's not environmental protection, but it's very much also uh, a humanitarian issue. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just uh, building on, on what, uh, what the previous speaker explained about some of the, the damage that we have seen in, in past conflicts, um, the oil wells and infrastructure that were damaged in connection with the Iraq conflict have, have had impacts on, on health. So we did see uh, increased uh, um, amounts of people coming to humanitarian healthcare providers uh, for shortage of breath, and other health issues that they had at the time. And also the, the burning uh, oil wells directly impacted food delivery, which had to be halted in uh, some locations. And also it, it impacts where you can put uh, things like uh, camps, for example. If you have a, a burning oil well, or if you have uh, waste, um, unmanaged waste dumps, you don't want to have a, a camp directly nearby. So it, in that respect, it's, it's also very much, it's a, it's a constraint for, for the humanitarian operation. Um, also, uh, the example of Yemen, uh, there we see, um, like uh, we were talking about the, the collapse of environmental governance uh, in some instances with um, difficulty to provide, uh, to have access to funds, which means that a lot of the, the normal processes that we see, like waste management, the water resources, are no longer operated normally. So that means that people are then exposed to unmanaged waste uh, street, which gives, again, um, has health implications and, and also can cause further epidemics. Um, also in connection with Yemen, there is of course the floating uh, storage uh, vessel SAFER, uh, which is really an environmental risk uh, that has been discussed also in the Security Council, uh, where uh, the fate of, of, of that uh, topic also has, has implications for the, uh, for the peace process. 
Um, the other thing, which maybe wasn't uh, discussed that much, but which is something that the Joint uh, Environment Unit works very much on, is displacement settings, um, where we do see that uh, that conflict and displacement. Um, people are displaced; they still need uh, they need food, but they also need energy to cook the food. They need water. They need fuel wood. They need shelter materials. Uh, so this really comes with an increased uh, risk of, of overuse of natural resources. So that's something that humanitarian actors and also member states uh, have to think about. Not only provide the, the uncooked beans, but also think about how will those beans be cooked and, and with what uh, energy. Next slide. I think one thing that I wanted to, to mention as well um, is, is really this is the environmental principle of, of the right to information, uh, which is key. And I think this is, in, in my experience, also one thing that, that is, is very relevant for, for humanitarian and, and peace building processes. Um, this is something that has to also do acutely with the well-being of, of civilians. Uh, because as we know, and this is not only the case in conflicts, but it's the case anywhere, uh, when there is a concern that there is an environmental contaminant in the water, in the soil, in the air, uh, that causes, that's a huge stress factor for people and that influences their livelihood option. Uh, so what do you do, for example, if you know that your water is contaminated, but it's the only water you have? you're still going to do. Um, but how does that make you feel and how does that make you feel when you're giving that water then also to, to um, children and, and to other vulnerable groups. When these issues are not addressed uh, either during the, the response or afterwards it also impacts recovery because there's these um, past conflicts and past knowing, knowing concerns that, that something is not right. Um, here, disadvantaged communities are often at, at greater risk, and, and this has also been, been documented, not only in conflict settings, but also in other urban settings. For example, they are the ones who live closer to the waste site, they are the ones who live where industrial affluence come out. So they are the ones that maybe don't have a choice. Um, and I think that the uncertainty around the cause and effect, uh, how damaging is this, and what can we do about it, is really part of, of what makes it very complicated and that's where we need more research and we need more better and more and better communication with with affected groups so that they they feel that they can safely safely use the, the resources they depend upon um, and there's quite a lot of, of documented cases around the world where there is unknown long-term impacts of, of weapons or, or industry and maybe some assessments are made but maybe are not neutral or independent, so people still don't trust the results. Uh, essentially, this leaves communities with a lack of risk management options. They don't know what to do about the issue and the access to justice as well. Um, and I think that's one thing that we should really have to address as well in, in conflict settings because it's, it's, it's essential if we are to build peace. Next slide. Mm, so some of the, the recommendations, uh, well, definitely we must adhere to international law, um, protection of the environment, and I think uh, the next speaker will also talk about this. There is already um, a law there um, about these things, and that's something that we all must adhere to. The other thing is that we have to address the environmental impacts of displacement and, and conflict. So, so we must um, see that that the environment and natural resources are part of the overall picture. Uh, we must, must promote sustainable solutions. Uh, I think it's important that we collect and share information on environmental damage for some of the reasons I outlined earlier. Um, and um, we can use uh, existing humanitarian channels and methods. So for example, environment is featured in the uh, Secretary General's report. And, and this is one thing that we can continue to do. And we can also use existing humanitarian systems and protection officers to support uh, these things. Environment is, is not different in that respect than any other uh, violation. We have to involve the affected populations for sure. Um, coordination and coming from a, a unit that deals very much with coordination, I think that is key. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, but it's not necessarily being shared across the various UN mechanisms and processes. So I call upon member states to also really share information. And then um, support the military and, and humanitarian actors. Environmental actors are often eager to get involved, but they don't know how to. 
uh, so they must be promoted and, and supported to do that. And and in this respect, uh, you know, the more we collect information and analyze the evidence and ongoing cases, the more we can then continue also the the discussions and and support accountability. Because ultimately, I think that this leads back to the to the civilian question and, and why it's a why it's a, a question also in terms of protection of civilians. Uh, it's a question of accountability and, and it's a question about doing the right thing and, and supporting the recovery in this building for the people most affected, for the people that are most vulnerable. So in this respect, we very, very much welcome the discussion and, and hope we cover it. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Um, I, I love the range of activities you're able to describe. It, it, Truth be told, it's only a pretty selective set of all the things that the joint unit does. But uh, I did want to highlight the fact that I think the joint unit's important for this discussion because it really is the UN institutionalization of the theme of today. Protecting the environment is protecting civilians. And this is the embedding of environmental expertise in the humanitarian response. So um, delighted you're able to be with us today. Next, we will hear from Vanessa Murphy. Vanessa is a legal advisor in the thematic unit of the International Committee of the Red Cross Legal Division in Geneva, where she works on the protection of the environment, among other issues. Since 2016, Vanessa has been part of the team drafting the ICRC's updated guidelines on the protection of the natural environment in situations of armed conflict, which is uh, expected later this year with much fanfare and much uh, anticipation by many of us in the community. Her experience in the ICRC includes litigation on behalf of survivors of childhood sexual abuse, the running of support services for survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking, and work for organizations including DCAF, Human Rights Now, and the International Criminal Law Media Review. Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me and for having invited the International Committee of the Red Cross to join this discussion today. It's one that we think is extremely important and that we're so pleased to be a part of. So thank you very much to the organizers. Um, my remarks today will address broadly three issues. The first is what we've been hearing about so clearly from um, RIM and from, from UNEP and OCHA about the links between the protection of the natural environment and the protection of civilians in armed conflict. The second area that I want to talk about is um, how the applicable legal framework under international humanitarian law protects the natural environment from, from the view of the ICRC. And then finally talk about what we think can be done to strengthen this protection um, and make sure that those rules in international humanitarian law are properly implemented by parties um, who are fighting armed conflict. So first of all, um, to, to essentially re-emphasize re exactly what Vim and Emilia have set out, which is that at the ICRC, we really see every day that civilians caught up in armed conflicts depend, in, depend completely on, on their environments and therefore impacts on it impact them um, immediately. So the natural environment we know is, is frequently a silent casualty of war. We see that too often it is directly attacked or incidentally damaged by the use of certain means or methods of warfare. It is also impacted by damage caused to the built environment. So, for example, as Vim and Amelia have set out, for when water sanitation and electricity services are, for example, disrupted by hostilities, attacks lead to water, soil and land contamination, and they render the drinking water and agricultural land more scarce for civilians who are already desperately in need. Explosive remnants of war remain etched into landscapes and cause contamination at times for decades. And biodiversity can be irreparably damaged when hostilities are conducted in hotspots. So the consequences of this kind of environmental damage for the civilian population are, are manifold and severe and complex. Civilians, simply put, depend on the natural environment for food and water. Farmers, herders, and fishing communities depend on it for their livelihoods. And when the environment is destroyed and food and economic insecurity intensifies as a result, the physical and mental health of conflict-affected populations deteriorate. Individuals and communities try to cope with this by adapting their ways of life, perhaps by moving away from their homes, 
but this capacity to adapt constricts as conflict and environmental degradation continue. Another point that we are observing at the ICRC is that climate risk, when combined with armed conflict and environmental degradation, make matters only worse. So countries in, our, in situations of armed conflict, including the ones that we work in, are disproportionately impacted by climate variability and extremes. And this is in part because of their geography, but mostly because conflicts and their consequences limit that adaptive capacity of people and systems and institutions. So what that means is when environmental degradation collides with climate shock, food and economic insecurity and health, health effects are, are badly exacerbated. Moving to the second point that I want to sort of explore is what the legal framework says about how we can limit this kind of environmental damage specifically with respect to how parties to armed conflict can try to limit the environmental damage that they cause. So here I want to set out the rules of IHL that protect the natural environment. I'll start by flagging that certainly IHL does not address all of this in all of, all of the environmental consequences that we've heard about here. Um, it is also not the only relevant legal framework. International environmental law, international human rights law may also be applicable. The International Law Commission's draft principles that they are currently working on are certainly very relevant there. Nevertheless, IHL does protect, contain certain rules that limit that, the damage that civilians will suffer from. So I want to spend a few minutes describing in a nutshell kind of what those protections are. And I'll say that the substance here is what forms the content of the forthcoming ICRC guidelines on the protection of the natural environment that we will release later this year. So broadly speaking, the protection that IHL provides can be divided into two rough categories. The first, quite simply put, is contained in the rules that specifically protect the natural environment as such, in that that is their primary purpose. So these include, for example, the prohibition against using means or methods of warfare that, is, that are intended or may be expected to cause long-term, widespread, and severe damage to the natural environment. That's, that's an important and well-known one. There are also other specific protections such as an explicit prohibition attacking the um, against attacking the natural environment um, by way of reprisal. That's sort of the first bucket of protection that IHL has, these quite specific protections to the natural environment. There's also a second type, which is the protection contained in what we refer to as general IHL rules that protect the natural environment without that necessarily being their primary, primary purpose. So, this hangs on the fact that it is generally recognized today that by default the natural environment and its composite parts or elements is civilian in character. So on this basis all parts of the natural environment are civilian objects unless parts of it have, unless they have become military objective under specific criteria. But because by default they are civilian in character that means they benefit from all the rules that IHL has to protect civilian objects including very importantly mean the rules of distinction, proportionality, and precaution. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking particularly about the principle of distinction and the principle, the principle of proportion, because for parties in armed conflict, applying those rules properly can extend important protection to parts of the natural environment during the conduct of hostilities. So first of all, on the principle of distinction, that principle requires that an attack cannot be directed against parts of the natural environment unless it is directed against a specific part that has become a military objective. Now that's quite a specific criteria. So for example, it may be the case that a part of the natural environment might become a military objective if by its nature, by its location, purpose or use, a distinct part of it makes an effective contribution to military action and its destruction, capture or neutralization would offer a definitive military advantage. All of that to say it's quite specific criteria, otherwise attacks against the natural environment are prohibited and that rule must be respected better. The second quite important principle in IHL is the principle of proportionality. What that means is based on its civilian character, the natural environment is protected against incidental damage in attacks. So it is prohibited to launch an attack against a military objective, which might be expected to cause damage that is excessive in relation to the military advantage anticipated. So an example of disproportionate incidental damage affecting the natural environment 
could be, for example, causing a large area of forest to burn down when attacking a very small enemy campsite that is of minor importance. It's also very important to take into account here that incidental damage must also take into account the foreseeable indirect or what we sometimes refer to as reverberating effects of an attack because the natural environment doesn't always isn't always impacted by a direct um, by an attack immediately it's important to take those longer term or incidental effects um, or rather sorry indirect or reverberating effects into account I'll leave it there and I won't go into too much more detail other than to flag that there are a number of other IHL rules that are very important to the protection of the natural environment. I'll flag them just very briefly. These include rules on speci specially protected objects such as objects indispensable to the survival of the population, that includes drinking water, that includes agricultural areas. There are also rules on the, on, um, the management or the treatment of enemy property that could include natural resources and the prohibition of pillage of those. Protection is also granted to the natural environment through the rules on the use of certain weapons. That includes rules on the use of herbicides, the prohibitions against using poison weapons, biological weapons and chemical weapons, and rules on landmines and rules to minimize the impact of explosive remnants of war. The legal framework, as you can see, is quite rich. It's really a question of, of ensuring that it is respected, known, and implemented properly. I will also take just a moment before moving to the final part, which is kind of a few recommendations as to how these protections can be better implemented to protect the environment in conflict, by again just making a note about the link to climate risks here of the substantive rules. So by limiting environmental degradation, better respect for IHL rules can also reduce the harm and risk to which conflict affected civilians are exposed as a result of climate change. So for example, climate change can, draw, can drive water scarcity and it can reduce the availability of arable land, both of which are obviously critical to civilian survival in many conflict affected contexts, including in many of the ones that the ICSC works in. So by prohibiting attacks on objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population, IHL protects these resources that are rendered additionally scarce by climate risk from additional conflict related violence. Final, I'll, I'll, before wrapping up, my, the final point that I want to sort of emphasize is, is what can be done and, and in the ICSP's view, how we think this protection that exists on paper can, can be better disseminated and implemented and enforced so that it is actually seen on the ground. So on, on, the, on the ICSC side, we have been working um, over the last few years to step up our own efforts to strengthen the implementation of these rules that I've just set out, which um, is culminating in autumn of this year of the release, with the release of what we, um, our 2020 guidelines on the protection of the natural environment in situations of armed conflict. So to provide a little bit of background, the IC, IC issued the first guidelines on this issue in 1994. Obviously, since then, the international legal framework has continued to develop and we simultaneously see continued devastating environmental consequences in many of the conflicts as those that Neely and Wim have described. And for this reason, we're, we're looking forward to updating the guidelines um, and continuing the conversation about how these rules can be better implemented. These guidelines will also be accompanied by a policy report that the ICRC will release on conflict and climate and on um, a research project that was carried out with a number of our delegations which looks at the exacerbated vulnerabilities of conflict affected communities and what they face in addition because of climate risks when they when they um, are simultaneously affected by conflict. Um, in, a, in I will leave you with four quite quick points that the ICRC proposes in terms of measures that states may adopt in order to ultimately reduce the environmental impact of armed conflict and, and the intrinsically linked um, impacts on, on civilians. The first is, is fairly straightforward. It is to disseminate and integrate IHL rules protecting the natural environment into armed forces doctrine, education, training, and disciplinary or sanction system. I flag that in, in this respect, we have found that national IHL committees and similar entities that exist at domestic level could be tasked to advise and assist national authorities to, to support this um, integration into military doctrine. 
The second is to adopt and implement measures to enhance understandings of the natural environment that operations occur in prior to or during military operations, whenever feasible and operationally relevant. The third is to consider identifying and designating areas of particular environmental importance or fragility as demilitarized zones, perhaps by reference, for example, to the World Heritage List or other frameworks out there that exist that identify these areas in peacetime. Finally, exchange examples and good practice relating to measures that can be taken to comply with these IHO obligations through activities such as conferences, military trainings, or indeed by publishing environmental impact studies. Um, and, and contributing, I believe, to this data sharing that, that Wim and Amelia have highlighted. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and I very much look forward to, to the forthcoming discussion. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And um, we are very much looking forward to the two reports that you mentioned, uh, the, the guidelines, the 94 version have been widely used and I think that the updating is going to serve the international community very well. So, um, before we open it for a uh, broader discussion, I want to share three um, quick thoughts. First of all, uh, today's discussion I think is usefully seen historically um, when the issue of the environmental impacts of war first came up. It was in the context of really first came up in the modern era, was in the context of the Vietnam War and the impacts of uh, herbicidal spraying and other tactics on the civilian population. And one, one of the people who was instrumental in that, Arthur Westing, just passed away um, after a very distinguished career, really putting these issues on the international agenda and keeping it on the agenda for decades. Since that time, there's been a lot of issues that have come up, um, everything from uh, water wars to conflict resources, and the relationship between environment, conflict, and peace has become much broader, uh, as, as Vim was describing in his presentation, the uh, protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict, across the conflict life cycle, the risks and the opportunities. But we need to remember that protection of civilians remains a critically important touchstone. This is where much of the, 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 the strongest protections are. Um, they may be narrow, but they're very strong. Um, and some of them aren't so narrow. And I think it's uh, time for us to revisit protection of civilians in, in the with the environmental lens in light of 50 years of experience and uh, practice. A second point, building on a few things that Vanessa uh, mentioned, um, it's really important to, to look at IHL, international humanitarian law, but to look beyond it also. And um, the, the, this is uh, important for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, well, looking at international criminal law, international human rights law, international humanitarian law, even international trade law in the UN Charter. There's a, there are a wide range of international law that uh, protects the environment in relation to armed conflict. This is important in part because they help to fill the gaps. That IHL, uh, there's a distinction between um, international armed conflict, where there are a lot more protections, and non-international armed conflict, where the protections, at least in the conventions, are weaker. Um, there may be uh, um, uh, developments with uh, customary international law, but the, 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 the convention protections are weaker. And so international human rights law, this applies throughout. So they, they can help fill some of these gaps. Um, normatively, they, uh, they can provide resources to help countries implement and comply. And they provide uh, a range of institutions to help ensure accountability. Um, the third point that I wanted to make uh, goes to some things that have come up a couple times that even though there's been a lot of practice in certain aspects, it's difficult to have this discussion within the UN framework. Um, the, the, that there are a lot of uh, UN agencies are working these things, but to have a 
big picture discussion. Uh, if it's in the security context, there are countries that will say, well, we should, this really is an environmental issue. We should take it out of the security context. And if it's in the environmental context, well, how do we talk about security issues not involving the security institutions? And so this uh, historic bifurcation between the, um, the, the security community and everyone else has been a challenge. And I, I um, would like to reiterate uh, Ambassador Lauber's uh, comments regarding uh, calls for a comprehensive approach to addressing the environmental consequences of war. And with that, I'd like to open it up for uh, questions and answer. Um, a few uh, rules. Um, so first of all, we'll, as I mentioned, we'll give priority to those who have registered interest with the organizers ahead. You can still submit questions using the Q&A function. When you take the floor, the organizers will um, unmute your microphone and uh, um, please select unmute and wait to be called upon by the moderator, me. Please be sure to introduce yourself, including your full name and affiliation, and inform the panelists to whom your question is addressed. Please be courteous to other participants and to the panelists, and keep your questions and comments brief so we can uh, enable as many people as possible to speak. And uh, once again, this event is being recorded and will be posted online at paxforpeace.nl after the event. I have three speakers that we will, uh, uh, three people that we will call upon first. Um, they are uh, His Excellency Mr. Ad Inga Kvalheim, uh, His Excellency Mr. Omar Hilale, and Mr. Fabiano Sartori de Campos. Uh, first, uh, His Excellency Mr. Ad Inga Kvalheim, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Mission of Norway to the United Nations. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a bit unusual. I don't see myself on the screen here, but I presume that you you can hear me. Uh, can hear me? Yes. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for convening on, on such an important uh, important topic. Many thanks to the Environmental Peacebuilding Association and and uh, the co-organizers uh, for this meeting. Um, we we uh, and and I think it was demonstrated very amply that uh, that there is a uh, strong link. And a clear link between conflict and, and the environment. We know that environmental degradation and the exploitation of the environment can be a, a driver of conflict, particularly, and that uh, natural resources are strongly connected uh, on, to the onset, duration, and recurrence of armed conflict. However, after, even after uh, armed conflict has formally ended, natural resources remain an important trigger for the relapse into armed conflict. And for these reasons, it is of the utmost importance, both from the security and the development perspective, to address natural resources as an integral part of the peace uh, process. Um, in our view, there are four opportunities to demonstrate the relevance of addressing the conflict environment nexus in the UN and in the Security Council. First, the collection of data. We need to apply frontier technologies to collect analyze and share data on, an, on environmental impacts uh, of armed conflicts. This can improve humanitarian responses, prevent or at least minimize environmental damage and related health impacts for affected communities. It could further contribute to post-conflict reconstruction and rehabilitation. Secondly, the UN Security Council already addresses issues related to conflict and natural resources. As the premier body tasked with maintaining international peace and security, the Security Council could serve as a platform that brings together ongoing international legal and policy discussions in a coherent framework, thus bridging the work of the ILC, the ICRC, and UNEA, among others. Thirdly, we also need to ensure that the environment in armed conflict is cross-cutting uh, it's a cross-cutting issue across all of the UN, United Nations work in order to improve coherence and collaboration among UN agencies and member states. This includes incorporating environmental protection in the mandates and budgets of UN peace operations, harmonizing with sustainable development 
and the SDGs, and particularly improving humanitarian responses. And finally, there's a need for building a mechanism inside the Security Council that serves as an awareness raising and response tool to help in conflict prevention over natural resources, support environmental peace building, contribute to the de-escalation of political tensions, address local grievances, and improve protection of civilians in armed conflict. The climate security mechanism established by DPPA, UNDP, and UNEP could potentially undertake this role, or at least be a model for the establishment of uh, a mechanism. I have a few other points too, but uh, I think I'll, I'll end by saying that, as you, you may know, Norway has the ambition of joining the UN Security Council, and there will be an election uh, in only three weeks' time. Um, but uh, if elected, we will bring our knowledge from peace and reconciliation work, uh, from our engagement in climate and environment uh, into the Security Council uh, with, the, with the clear understanding that the most important job maybe that the Security Council can do is prevention and, and uh, uh, finding its place in the wider, uh, I should say, I wouldn't say arsenal, but in the, in the wider architecture of UN um, agencies uh, to make a difference on the ground. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, all the best and thanks so much again for um, inviting on this um, to a meeting on this uh, important uh, subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Paulheim. And I would like to also acknowledge a lot of very foundational work in this area that Norway has supported over the years. So um, we are very uh, pleased to have you with us today and um, very grateful for the um, many efforts you have supported and led over the years. Next, uh, I'd like to call upon His Excellency Mr. Omar Halale, Permanent Representative of the Mission of Morocco to the United Nations. Thank you very much, sir, for inviting me to take floor. And I would like to thank you for organizing this meeting and also taking the, uh, all the panelists who really present to us very uh, informative element of information and keeping the, this issue of environment protection of uh, civilian and uh, the environment at, at the same level and are interlinked. I have just uh, two questions. As we are all aware, COVID-19 pandemic has had multiple severe human, economic, social, humanitarian, and environmental impacts on all societies which has made the protection of civilians agenda and scope, particularly in conflict contexts, even more complex. This pandemic has further exacerbated the vulnerability of the most fragile countries and the most vulnerable people, especially refugees, migrants, and IDPs. Thus, I would like to ask our esteemed panelists about what could be done by the international community to help humanitarian, medical, and and deployed personnel to carry out their life-saving assistance activity, especially in conflict-affected states. Second, 2019 Secretary General reports on the protection of civilians emphasize the negative impact of conflict on the environment. It highlighted that armed conflict has a direct and significant impact on the natural environment, leading to long-term habitat destruction, direct loss of wildlife from poaching of, or because it becomes a food source for conflict-affected population over exploitation and degradation of natural resources, and the increase in soil, air, and water pollution. In this regard, how can the issue of environment, peace, and security be better integrated in the UN system to improve capacities to protect civilians and civilian infrastructures and be part of inclusive post-conflict reconstruction and environmental peace building. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, I'd li now like to open, uh, ask the um, panelists to respond to the questions and observations made. Um, uh, who would like to start? Amelia? 
Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for the for the questions and the comments. Um, there was a lot of, of um, interesting remarks and um, um, also from uh, starting with the Norwegian representative. I, I think this is this is very true that that there is uh, a lot that we have to do and environment really has a has a role in peace building. Uh, so taking that and answering maybe the, the question from Morocco, the second question first, uh, how can we make sure that environment is included um, and better integrated within the, within the UN system? I think uh, it's definitely, it's coming. And, and I think what we see now in parts of uh, with UN reform and also at the increased uh, emphasis on sustainable development as well as on analysis and assessment and comprehensive analysis and assessment i think this is very much coming at the um that we are bringing all the actors together to try to get a comprehensive picture of of what are the different dimensions to, to a specific country's development context but also to specific conflicts and, and how can we use that within peace building but i i think it's also something that that we member states so to continue to raise this issue in the respective forum fora because I, I think it's sometimes uh, the different fora have their own communities and it's hard for them to sometimes step out of their box so I think it's important that, that we keep mentioning it uh, also um, in our own governments and organizations and I guess uh, just on the question on, on, on COVID um, it's true that this puts an enormous additional pressures on, on, on humanitarian response systems. And, and there I can only ask that people contribute to response efforts and, and contribute with, with funding and, and support to the existing humanitarian mechanisms and, the, and the, the global appeals, both in terms of COVID response, but also then in, in the other ongoing appeals and ongoing. Vim, would you like to follow up on some of the points that were just made? Yes. And, uh, yes, thank you very much. And thank you for your uh, comments and remarks for your excellencies and um, for the helpful questions. Um, first of all, also thanks to Norway for also their support for the current cleanup of the oil pollution in Iraq, um, which is a, um, a welcomed uh, gesture, uh, considering the implications for local communities there. And secondly, on the question on the COVID-19, I think at the moment the issue we're looking at, uh, for especially in, in Ukraine and Syria, we urge states to uh, apply pressure on those states who are currently uh, violating um, the the uh, agreements on uh, on the ceasefire um, in Syria and in Ukraine, um, because their the shelling of water infrastructure there contributes to a lack of access to clean water, and also uh, to open up borders for humanitarian support, because there is a lack of access to um, medical equipment and humanitarian equipment to for water purification and for medical assistance uh, to those affected areas, uh, in particular in Syria where this is needed. So this is also something where I think um, member states can play a role in in, uh, in both the Security Council and the wider UN system on how to better in, inter, uh, integrate the environment. I think that's also, I think there's a lot of what I mentioned as well, a lot of work has already been done, um, but it's very siloed and minimal. It's in my own experience working in Iraq and, and Syria. Uh, so you see different UN agencies like WHO or humanitarian agencies that have their own knowledge, body of knowledge, or their own uh, cluster, but they're not always communicating well together. So um, I think that's there's improvement to be made there. And I think if there's a possibility to have a, like a central framework um, where information can go into, and there's already there are good examples of humanitarian data exchange websites, um, but this can be improved and strengthened that, uh, that um, information is shared quicker, but also that the information is collected faster because some particular environmental health risks are not yet as identified as such because they're not on the radar. And that's why the work we're currently doing is trying to identify what it is that can be uh, collected in terms of data and where this data can be fed into and who's responsible for responding to that. And I think also we have to look at uh, extending the mandate or so providing more funding to relevant agencies, uh, such as, for example, UN Environment, 
uh, to do more work on post-conflict construction because they're also limited in terms of uh, funding and mandates where I think more work is needed there to uh, to make their uh, impact uh, better in, in terms of uh, reconstruction efforts. And I think there's a role for the UN and also for the Security Council and other UN agencies to uh, to underscore that in um, in the in a relevant forum where this is being addressed, such as UNIA, uh, but also in the Security Council itself to establish like a, a proper mandate to to deal with that. Vanessa, do you have something you'd like to add? Very briefly, because thank you to Rin and Amelia for for very comprehensive an answers. I think um, one. Th thing that we are thinking about in the coming years the, um, with respect to the question on the effect of the COVID pandemic and how that has placed humanitarian organizations under huge pressure. Part of, a huge part of the reason for that huge pressure is the impact that civilians are having to deal with when all of these different issues are combined. And particularly when all of those issues are combined, issues of the environment very quickly fall off the agenda. So I think from our, from our perspective, one of the things that states can do is to ensure that it doesn't fall off, simply just that it doesn't fall off the agenda at the end of the list of the pandemic and conflict and so on. I feel, yes, that it's important to make sure that it stays at the forefront and it's understood to be closely, closely interlinked. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time. We have three uh, more people who have uh, indicated uh, interest in uh, asking questions, uh, Abigail Watson, Doug Weir, and Lindsay Cook, and I'll take them in that order. Um, again, please introduce yourself and be brief. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Abigail, uh, to you first. Abigail, if you um, if you can unmute. Maybe while we're trying to sort that out, if we could go to Doug Weir. Hi, Doug Weir from the Conflict and Environment Observatory. Can you hear me, Carl? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, thank you to everybody, the panelists uh, and the uh, ambassadors. Um, really interesting session. Um, I had one question which I wondered whether the government representatives might be able to address, but it's also to the panellists themselves. As we've heard in the session, conflict and environment issues are being raised in a number of different fora at the moment. So Security Council, General Assembly, Environment Assembly, IUCN World Congress. As civil society, we've sometimes found it difficult to speak to governments and engage with them because different parts of government are dealing with these issues in different fora. What suggestions or proposals do you think there could be to help improve communication and coordination across governments and also between governments and civil society on these issues to help push these issues forward in the different forum? Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And uh, Lindsay Cook, please. Uh, yes, hello. My name is Lindsay. I'm um, the representative for climate change at the Quake United Nations office in Geneva. But noting that the current rate of global temperature rise and thus stabilized would lead to extreme loss of life and destabilization worldwide. The question is, um, as most states would agree that protecting their citizens is a governance priority, how can international efforts help states recognize now that urgent action today to transform the root causes of climate change and other environmental crises is essential to protecting their citizens. Thank you. Just want to make sure, Abigail, are you there? Okay. Then uh, maybe panelists, uh, if you would like to address the questions that are on the floor. Um, we might be able to get one more round of questions. Amelia? Um, thank you. Yes, I guess um, 
on the on the question of of, of government uh, engagement and, and and silos, I, I think this is one thing that we all struggle with within our own organizations as well. Um, and I just have a, a very you know, practical um, solution to that one, not a solution, maybe, but a suggestion. I think that each and every one who who listens in on on this uh, discussion. Um, and on other similar things who reads uh, interesting reports, we must take it upon ourselves to, to go out and reach out actively to our colleagues uh, working in different departments and ministries and organizations. Uh, there's a lot of groups and networks and uh, places where information can be found. There's lots of stuff happening also on the environment humanitarian action side. Uh, but what we are, and we have a lot of very passionate uh, people that are making a massive change uh, by being active, by reaching out. So, so I would encourage everyone to to please do that with your own organization. I think that's a good first step, at least uh, you know, as we as we go on this longer path. Um, Ambassador uh, Lauber, do you have uh, any thoughts on some of the comments we've had so far? Yeah, thank you very much. I quickly, uh, first of all, thanks again for this uh, really fantastic discussion to the panelists and also to all those who asked questions. Maybe a few thoughts on the last two questions uh, we've heard about the how to bring uh, governments as such and then governments and civil society together to work uh, across the silos. I very much agree with Emilia. We have, it's, it's an individual effort we have to make. We as governments ourselves find this a challenge uh, once in a while. But um, I think it's getting better. We have now concepts out there like um, uh, what we're discussing today. The protection of civilian concept is a, is a, is a cross silo uh, concept that is offering opportunities to address the, 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 wider, the wider issues. We have concepts like um, sustaining peace, uh, human security as such as one. And I think the understanding that the, the different pillars have to work together uh, is, is increasing. The fact that we have people now in this uh, event today from New York, but also from outside, from capitals, from Geneva is helpful. Um, civil society and, and government exchanges, I think we see two trends. On, on the one hand, we see uh, a bit of a, of, a, of a pushback against civil society uh, participation in intergovernmental processes. That's not something my government subscribes uh, to uh, clearly. Switzerland is for inclusive processes, and there we have to make uh, common efforts um, uh, to, to address that. But we also see a trend, and, and I think what we've seen actually over the last few weeks uh, when many of these uh, events now go go virtual, go online. And one of the positive effects I see is an increased inclusivity we have. Uh, we, are, we are using the opportunities that are there to bring in new quality of briefers to open the circle of participants. And I think that's a positive trend we need to, we need to, we need to pursue, we need to continue. And to respond to the question uh, of the colleague from the Quakers office in Geneva, what to do um, to to uh, in a post-COVID phase to, or, or right now, she didn't say post-COVID, but right now to, to, to get better in, in addressing the issues you were discussing today. Here again, in recent, maybe just days even, or, or, or maybe weeks, and there I feel an increasing trend of, uh, around the issue of build back better. I think there's movement in that, and I think there is willingness uh, among member states, among, among international organizations, among civil society, to now think about what that means when we are um, recovering, uh, building back, uh, building on what we have. Do we want to go back to what we had before? Or do we try to, do we want to try new approaches? Uh, new new ways and, and this term built back better I, I keep hearing that more and more and I think again there is an opportunity as difficult as the situation is right now I see an opportunity there too so build back better when we look into the challenges of protection of civilians and the link to environmental um, impacts of, of conflict what what do we do in our approaches in our traditional peace building peacekeeping uh, humanitarian approaches to bring this together and, and, and take into account what's, what's, what's necessary in terms of, of environmental protections and, and, uh, and, uh, and the effects between the two. 
So on, on both accounts, um, I see the challenges, but I also see actual opportunities uh, right now. Thanks for, for giving me the floor again on this. Thank you for your remarks. Um, I think I'd like to wind up discussion here, uh, give the panelists each uh, 60 seconds for one final thought um, on the topic, uh, and then we will uh, um, turn the floor over to Ambassador Key for closing remarks. Um, start with uh, Vim. Thank you, Carl. And um, yeah, thanks uh, again for all the good questions and um, for uh, attending this session. I think uh, what today showed is that this, this is the beginning of uh, hopefully uh, a longer journey where we do indeed cross bridges between the different fora with expertise and experts to uh, address the various issues that helps to protect, uh, understand better what the conflict dynamics are how to include the environment into the different processes to best to respond to the challenges posed by the environmental dimensions of armed conflict, but also to look beyond indeed to look at how this impact climate change. And I think, for example, uh, one good starting point is, uh, or a good example would be Iraq, where we can also see where um, the armed conflicts of the last couple of decades has undermined um, the state uh, capacity to uh, deal with um, uh, climate-related stressors. So we saw of course, two years ago, of course, in Basra, where uh, water security was seriously impacted because there was a lack of investment in that. And, and it sort of helps, uh, also sort of impacts the larger uh, development in the country. So I think that's why it's important to invest in post-conflict situations in uh, reparations and reconstruction of environmental um, of environmental infrastructure uh, to prevent wars and uh, indeed anticipate uh, through better mechanisms and coordination uh, both in the UN system but also between civil society and governments to improve this and see if we can work towards building a proper uh, construction that uh, facilitates uh, information sharing and response. And uh, we, we're looking forward to continue with, with governments and with civil society organizations to work on this. Amelia. Final thought? Yeah, thank you so much uh, to, for all the good questions and the stimulating discussion. Uh, from my side, uh, maybe just a final thought to leave you with. Um, what has struck me in the, in the past 10 years working on, on this topic of environment humanitarian responses is that there is really a lot of willingness of environmental actors to get involved, but also of humanitarian actors to, to work on this topic. Uh, however, many people feel a bit overwhelmed. They feel it's it's complex. Um, but do reach out. Uh, do reach out to people with outside your community. Um, explain what you're working on and see how you can work together. Uh, because there's a lot of expertise out there. There's a lot of people who want to work together. They just maybe don't find the right ways. But what we are finding now in in the work of the Joint Environment Unit is that that. That there is there is expertise, there is willingness, so so we should just all come together, and that's at least a, a first step to start addressing some of these quite uh, complex uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Vanessa. Um, thank you very much to everybody for such such a rich and meaningful discussion. I think, and uh, I think the final point for me is just a, a renewed emphasis on the importance of of um, prevention. So. Um, not only in, in mapping and uh, no, having better data sharing around environmental damage in conflict, but ensuring that prevention efforts are just as strong. So what that means is ensuring that domestic frameworks, whether it's military practice or, or, or government policy, really from now in peacetime also ensures that those reflect the, the legal standards that are out there. I thought I would just quickly flag um, a couple of good examples recently in this respect. So at the 2019 December um, conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, a number of states made pledges to, to ensure that their um, domestic frameworks better, re better reflect the protection of the environment in armed conflict and that they will sort of rededicate to looking at this issue. So I think there's a lot of good, good examples out there and that, and that those efforts should continue. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I'd now like to uh, invite Ambassador Dang Din Ki, permanent Representative of the Soviet of the Socialist Republic. Sorry, 
Let's try that again. I'd like to invite His Excellency Mr. Dang Din Ki, permanent representative of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam to the United Nations. Ambassador Ki serves as the permanent representative of Vietnam since July 2018. Before that, he served as the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs in charge of strategic policy planning, rector of the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam, and other positions. Ambassador Key, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for your very kind and long introduction of myself here. Yeah. And uh, I think that we have a very good uh, turnout. That, uh, I watched that one with a big number, the 87 participants to our discussion today. That, uh, we are very happy with that. So on behalf of the co-host, I would like to express our gratitude to all the panelists and to all the vivid discussion with the participants. So we listened uh, and we got a lot of information, update and argument and comment and rec uh, recommendations on the issues that uh, I think it's um, undoubtedly that is very, very clear that uh, like nexus between the environmental protections and the protection of civilians in the context of, uh, you know, armed conflict everywhere, and the relations now even more and more getting closer. Yes, uh, the the context of the armed conflict everywhere is changing, and it also combined, powdered by the climate change, and also the changing in the way of warfare that the different armed conflicts party that EU here. So uh, I would like to make it not a kind of concluding remark, but I would like to add a few points of myself. First of all, that the environment uh, is uh, often considered the common public goods. So the protection of the environment everywhere, and especially in the armed conflict also, they must be a, a, a collectively, and it is a, a shared responsibility for everyone like here. In the time of the armed conflict, the environment has been subject to, you know, sometimes the in, indiscriminate, in, indiscriminate attacks. And it sometimes exploits the method of warfare to, get, to, to have the military gains. The so armed conflict takes the heavy toll on the biodiversity, the air, the water system, the infrastructure critical to the survival of human life, so everything. So in this regard, we strongly believe that the first and foremost, the party to the armed conflict must fully respect the obligation under international humanitarian law regarding the protection of environment. And we, has, we, we, we heard a lot of recommendation about what can we do to enforce the humanitarian law that regarding protection of environment. And people are talking about that the state party especially the member states have to do something. But the question still hanging that how can we do with the non-state actors in this? And this, uh, I think that it's more and more difficult for us to make the, the, the law to be enforced with these kind of actors. And the next point I want to, 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 to raise here is that um, we, uh, it would be a kind of premise if we do not mention the role of the multi-stakeholder approach. So we have, different kind of stakeholder, but the uh, region organization, uh, I think, is a very good um, player to provide assistance and administers the implementation of the uh, humanitarian law regarding protection environment. And then we have private sector, we have industries, and they also have a lot of activity and responsibility to share resources and assist building resilience in during the you know, conflict and also in recovery effort. Uh, last but not least, is that protection of environments must stretch beyond the armed conflict. Because uh, in the period of post conflict, environment restoration is a no less importance in sustaining human life and enabling faster and more sustained recovery. So in our case that uh, as Colin that mentioned it, that the war ended, um, I mean, 45 years ago, since 1975. But uh, about 3 million Vietnamese people have suffered from severe health problems because of uh, the dioxide, uh, as in orange. And beside a, a massive area of, of thousands of acres was contaminated. 
So now how to clean it? It takes time. And also it takes a lot of money to do and a lot of you know, attention to that. So to address, addressing these issues, it requires a lot of resources and dedication. In this regard, that, uh, I think we highly appreciate the assistance from bilateral partner, the United Nations Agency, international community, and everyone. So finally, that I would like to once again express my sincere appreciation for the fellow co-hosts, the organizing committee, and also the, the panelists and all participants for taking part in this very, I mean, that very informative event, and it's very helpful for the people like me who are working on, you know, on the Security Council in the next uh, two years on the issues. So uh, once again, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Key. And, um, I thought you did a wonderful job of tying together a lot of these threads uh, in a very short period of time. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And uh, um, if you were not able to be here for the whole event, or if you would like to share the event with others, the recording will be posted on the PAX website, paxforpeace.nl. Again, that's paxforpeace.nl. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay well, stay safe. Thank you.